What happens when one man tries to watch all the horror films of the 1980s? Well, we're about to find out because I'm your host, Josh Spiegel, and this is The 80s Project, 1982. Oh, welcome to The 80s Project. If you're just joining us, this is our journey through all the horror films of the 1980s. And this is the very first episode of 1982. Now, if you're new to this series, I should tell you that this will be a very American-based view of the movies. And even though I'll try to cover the international efforts that made an impact on the U.S., I won't be covering all of those. And after I give you a breakdown of each movie, I'll give it my own personal rating out of five. And then rate its horror cultural significance, which is essentially how much did I think that that film impacted the genre. And again, keep in mind, that's mostly based on America. So some films may be more significant in their native countries. And then I'll just give you a quick recommendation if it's essential to watch in terms of the decade or not. But enough about all of that. Let's kick off 1982. This kicks off in an unusual place in Indonesia on January 1st with the classic Satan's Slave. Not to be confused with the 1976 film of the same name that featured Michael Gao. And actually, the translated title is Pengabdi Satan. And we start with a large funeral. And this young lady with very unusual tastes in wall calendars. It's a woman who died and her two children are mourning. And that night, little Tommy is visited by her ghost, who apparently saw Salem's lot. Although she maybe is interested in his, in his cat poster. He seems to be enthralled with her, which worries his sister, but then goes to see a fortune teller who apparently saw Phantasm. And then they get a new mysterious housekeeper. Soon, that spirit is showing up to haunt them all, and Tommy is having these weird visions of masked cults and ritual sacrifice. It's soon revealed that after their mother's death, the family has renounced their faith and no longer pray, which this guy says will allow the devil to get in. And after a bit, people in their life start to die off and show back up as horrific ghouls. And again, this was an Indonesian film directed by Siswaro Gautama Putra, the same guy who bought you Shrigala, otherwise known as Wolf, otherwise known as Indonesian Friday the 13th, a movie I featured on the 1980 version of the project. But this is a very different film. It's still clearly inspired by Western horror, as I pointed out a bit earlier, but overall, it does have a very phantasm vibe since it has this whole dreamlike atmosphere and the whole thing about their recently dead friends coming back after them. After its release, it went a bit under the radar and it was out of print for a while. And Asian horror fans would have to seek it out on bootleg versions that mostly didn't have subtitles. But in recent years, it's found new success. It's had several remastered releases. In 2017, a remake was released called Satan's Slaves by Joko Anwar, who also directed a remake of Gundala, a movie I featured in the 81 sci-fi project. The new version was a huge hit, further pushing this one into a more mainstream eye, and it even got a sequel with Satan's Slaves 2, Communion. And I really like this one. It's a solid three and a half tapes from me. Honestly, this is why I do the 80s project, to find movies that I enjoy that I had never really given a shot to before. I'd have even given it a four if it weren't for the kind of sluggish middle portion. Its significance is only a 1.5 though, since it was never a big hit here in the States, and it's considered more of a lost cult classic that has found a new audience. It had more relevance overseas though. Should you watch it? Oh, absolutely. This is a fun treat and a great way to start 1982. <laughs> this next number was possibly a TV movie, but also may have been a theatrical release, but it debuted on January 22nd. And it's Burned at the Stake, also known as The Coming. It starts with the Salem witch trials and several people being falsely accused, including a child of being witches. 
Then, in modern times, little Audrey Rose is on her school field trip to go to a the witch museum. And they see a woman they declare is one, and she gets a mysterious injury. At the museum, she learns about the evil Reverend Putnam, just in time for one of the wax figures to come to life and flee into the city. Soon, Lorene is watching her teacher get killed in an accident and having a full-fledged meltdown haunted by spirits from the past. And her mom tries to defend her by shooting the wax guy, but nothing happens. I never saw a woman who is a real woman that can handle a gun. And it's hilarious because they then spend two whole scenes with her mom trying to convince people that she knows how to shoot a gun, but they don't believe her because she's a woman. It seems at various times that she's meant to be possessed by Anne Putnam, the young girl who accused people of being witches, or possibly is the reincarnation of her, or she just is her? I I'm not sure, and I'm not sure if the movie is either. And of course, shenanigans happen. Necromicon. <laughs> the Necromicon? I, I had uh, some guy in some other movie call it the Necromonicon, and now this? And this is directed by the legendary Bert I. Gordon, who had a string of great B movies throughout the 50s, 60s, and 70s, including the Colossal Man movies, Village of the Giants, and even The Food of the Gods. But by the 80s, his output would slow down. This was his first film in five years since 77's Empire of the Ants, and it's certainly not one of his more noted entries, and it seems like the actual release date is of some dispute. The MPAA gave it its rating back in 81, and it's sometimes listed as coming out in 1980, although that may just be when it was copyrighted. And there were some advertisements for it in October of 81, but there's not confirmation of any of those dates, so it may have been released earlier, but there's records of the screenings in January of 82, so that's where it goes on here. And this one gets a 2 from me. There's fun stuff going on, but for the most part, it's a slog to get through. Although I appreciate that they presented a modern witch in a positive light instead of the negative stuff from this era. Its significance is just a 1.5 though, since it's nearly completely forgotten, but it gets the extra 0.5 for being a part of Gordon's filmography. Should you watch it? You can likely skip it. Uh, no one will burn you at the stake if you do. Burn the witch! 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 Our next entry arrived in February, and we're already into the second month of the year here, but our next release was on February 12th, and it's The Beast Within. The opening of the film is in 1964, and a young married couple are on the back roads, and it's Dick Jones, and a creature is in the woods and assaults Carolyn. And then it jumps ahead 17 years, and they have a son, a product of that rape. And he's very ill and having fever dreams about spooky old houses. The McClearys decide that they need to find out more about his mystery father in order to help them figure out what's ailing young Michael, well, he starts to exhibit strange behavior, heads to the town he was conceived in, and kills the local newspaper man. Uncle Lewis shows up just in case there's any cursed antiques, and then there's this guy that you might recognize from, I don't know, only every TV show ever, pretty much. And this one was adapted from a novel that came out in 1981 that had the same name, although they appear to be extremely different. They really only share the most basic plot premise and nearly every other detail has been changed, most likely because the rights to the novel were purchased based on the name only and the book itself wasn't done as they were doing pre-production on the film. The man hired to adapt the incomplete book was none other than Tom Holland, but not the Spider-Man one, the cool one. And this would actually be his first work in Hollywood. Of course, he'd later go on to write and direct a number of huge hits and gave us the first Child's Play, as well as Fright Night. But this is where he started, making up a story to be based on a book that didn't exist yet. He didn't direct those, since that job went to Philip Mora, uh, an Australian director that hadn't really dipped into the world of horror yet, but would soon give us the amazing Howling 2 and the alien flick Communion. 
One of the more notable moments in the movie is the big special effects transformation scene because those were pretty trendy at this time. And this one's pretty wild and became the film's calling card and was one of the few things that got good mentions in the reviews. Most of the criticisms were on the acting and flat script, but it did okay with audiences, making almost 8 million bucks on a budget of 5. Although Holland himself wasn't quite happy with the way it turned out, and in recent years was talking about trying to remake it since he thought his original script was better than the finished product. Although there's been no activity on that, so it seems unlikely at this point. And I'm giving this one a three. It's a nice watch, it has some great effects near the ending, but it, it's pretty tiresome to get there. Uh, the finale rocks though. Its significance is a 2.5 since I feel like this is a little more known, but not that much. It's still pretty under the radar, but it's Tom Holland's first gig, had Mora in the chair, and had recognizable faces. Should you watch it? Yes, but just know that it's not fun right out of the gate. This next one debuted in Italy on March 4th, but wouldn't get a US release until October of 84. And it's the Fulci classic, The New York Ripper. It starts with an investigation into a discovered body, a murdered model, and we then see the next victim, a young woman on a ferry. And we hear what this film may be the most known for. The killer quacks like a duck, or like Donald Duck in particular. He then continues on killing in over-the-top fashions and then calling Detective Williams to taunt him, all the while quacking up. So he hires a psychologist to help him track the killer. And like I said, this is another Fulci film, Lucio Fulci. And if you're not familiar, the man is an Italian horror legend. He's perhaps most well known for Zombie, but already on the project we've covered four of his films. City of the Living Dead, The Black Cat, The Beyond, and The House by the Cemetery. This whole little couple year era was like ground zero for Fulci goodness. And this is a bit of a sleazier affair than normal for him. There's a number of scenes with over-the-top sexuality and nudity featured here, and that appears to be all Fulci's additions, since Dardano Sarchetti, one of the film's writers, stated that very little of that was in the actual script, and that the director added those scenes, as he seemed to have a particular sadism towards women. Lucio himself had high hopes for this one, claiming that it was more down-to-earth and grounded than most of his supernatural-themed flicks, and that it was his tribute to Hitchcock, in a way. Of course, it was met with some split opinions by the critics, who would comment on the general griminess of the proceedings and the weird, fractured plotline. Although for a Fulci film, it's downright linear. One place that definitely wasn't split on it was the UK, and even though they didn't put it on the nasty list, they outright banned it and it wasn't available there until 2002. And even then, it was only released with cuts made. It did quite well at the box office, a first a success in its home country of Italy, but also made a nice profit in others as well, including the US. And you all know that I love me some Fulci, and this is pretty fun, although I admit a touch more reserved than his usual stuff, but I give this one a 3.5. It's enough of what I want from one of his films although I admit it's not as strong as some of the others. Its significance is the same since it's pretty well remembered, a part of Fulci's catalog, and I think everyone knows this as the movie with the guy with the duck voice. Should you watch it? You can never understand! You're too stupid! This next little number arrived in Canada first and came out on the 12th of March. It wouldn't hit the US until January of 85, and it's superstition and it begins with a couple making out in front of a house that they say is haunted you know the best place to make out i guess and they're scared off by some pranksters who are then both attacked by some sort of evil microwave that ex explodes heads and cut in half we then meet young reverend david thompson and he's told that the old house is on church property and the murders caused them to go investigate and this guy right here is James Houghton. And sure, he did some acting, mostly in soap operas, but he apparently had a bigger impact behind the scenes of them. 
He wrote 854 episodes of The Young and the Restless from 1991 until 2006. So being in front of the camera here wasn't his primary gig. There's a caretaker here, and for all you Surf 2 fans, this is Big Head. Bow bow. More accidents happen with the pond and with power saws and elevators and, and then baby Beastmaster is here and damn this kid was everywhere. This is Billy Jane's third appearance on the project so far, having shown up in both Bloody Birthday and X-Ray. There's the tale of a family that previously lived in the house that were all murdered and a mysterious little girl that keeps on showing up. And this was from James W. Robertson and his directing gigs are pretty limited. He, he did three films, including this one, and two episodes of a TV show, but has a much, much larger roster of work in the cinematography world and camera field, and seems to be very active in the industry still. The making of this one is fairly interesting in that it had a bit of a fractured filming. The original script and film were just about the family moving into the house that's haunted by the witch. After they finished principal photography, they realized that the film was a bit um, underwhelming. So they did a large number of reshoots. All of the flashback footage, everything with the old woman and Arlen, and everything at the lake were all added after the fact, making for a bit of a scattered narrative. Also, this was a bit of an oddity because it was filmed in 81 and did get screenings in 82, but only in Canada, the Philippines, and Italy. It played in a few other select countries, sometimes called The Witch, but as far as the US goes, it was thrown onto a shelf for a good couple of years and then given a small theatrical run before being sent to home video in 85. It drew a bit of fire in the UK, although it managed to stay off of the video nasty list and was put on their Section 3 roster, which was a list of movies that couldn't be prosecuted for obscenity, but were still liable for seizing and confiscation, and were sometimes destroyed after the sellers forfeited them. And this one gets a 3 from me, it has that vaguely Fulci vibe that I like, and it sort of feels like an Italian film in the US, but never hits that level of atmosphere. It still has some solid moments though, even if nothing seems to really connect. Its significance is just a two though, since it's a bit more obscure and not really talked about and doesn't feature much in the way of horror names. Should you watch it? Sure, but not if you're superstitious, but maybe if you're a little stitious. On that same day, March 12th, back in the US, there was a fairly notorious entry with the release of Parasite. This starts in a lab with an experiment going on, but something clearly goes wrong. But that's just a dream, and it's some sort of a post-apocalyptic future, complete with laser guns. Paul here encounters some scavengers out there, and fights them with a large number of things oddly being pointed directly at the camera. He encounters Scott Thompson from Ghoulies and Police Academy, and ends up staying in a small inn but it appears as if he's hiding a secret in his belly. There's a group of troublemakers that includes Tom Villard, but also Luca Bercovici, who appeared on the project already in Fright Manor. And as I mentioned there, he would go on to direct as well. He directed Ghoulies, but also directed Rockula. Uh, plus, there's this girl here, Cherie Curie, and rock fans will know her as the singer of The Runaways. Then, little baby G.I. Jane shows up one of her very first film roles. And Demi Moore has stated in interviews that this was the worst movie that she's ever done. And the only thing that tells me is that she hasn't seen that many of her own movies. The gang decide to rip off the dock, but accidentally unleash the thing that he has kept in a container, which immediately attacks. There's also a mysterious man in a cool car hunting for him, killing those that get in his way. And as I mentioned earlier, there's a whole lot of poking stuff at the camera, and that's because this was originally released in 3D and was widely hyped as such. And the director was none other than Charles Van, the man behind Full Moon, and director of about a hundred things that you've heard of, including Trancers. And this was one of his first works as well, and his first horror work. It was made on a pretty low budget of 800k, and actually did pretty well in box office sales, earning a nice 5.5 million possibly due to the boom of 3D films at this particular time. 
Reviews weren't kind though, with lots of critics blasting the cheap nature of it and a lot of discussion of the bad acting, even though several of the players would go on to bigger things. And it's not just in front of the camera, since the Parasite's effects were partially done by Stan Winston. His career was up and running by this point, and he had already been nominated for a makeup effects Oscar, even though it's for the movie Heart Beeps. But I'd be willing to bet that if you asked him about the two, he'd probably be more embarrassed by this one as opposed to Heart Beeps. And this one is just a two for me. Sure, there's just there's some fun effects and low budget charm, but that's it. It's dull and poorly acted and doesn't even do anything with the decent ideas that it has. Its horror cultural significance is a three though, since it is pretty well known, although still on a cult level, but also had the start for more and featured Winston effects and was a part of the 3D revolution of the 80s as well. Should you watch it? I suppose for a curiosity standpoint, yes, but just, just know that it's not that great. Let's go. So this next one I was hesitant to include because calling it horror is a bit of a stretch, but I figured it deserved inclusion. And on March 19th, there was the release of Death Trap. It has Hoagie as an esteemed playwright whose latest work is a major flop, and his wife is Diane Cannon. He tells her that he's lost his inspiration and has received a script from a former student that he thinks is perfect and comes up with a pretty devious plan to kill him and steal it. He invites him over and he's not just a writer, he's a star reporter for the Daily Planet. And at the house, Myra desperately tries to talk Sidney out of his scheme and simply collaborate with Clifford. Things get pretty tense right away and there's some back and forth, but he eventually strangles him to death. But then things get complicated as Myra wants to leave him and they get a visit from a neighboring psychic who seems to know something weird has happened. But things really take a turn when it turns out that Clifford is not as dead as he seems, and there's a different sort of game afoot. And this was based on a Tony-nominated play of the same name by Ira Levin. And if that name is familiar, it's because he's the man who wrote The Rosemary's Baby, The Stepford Wives, A Kiss Before Dying, and tons more. And the film adaptation was directed by the great Sidney Lumet, director of so many great films, including Dog Day Afternoon, Serpico, Network, and, and oh yeah, The Wiz. And man, don't get me started on The Wiz because I'll make a whole video about it. In Death Trap, the casting of Christopher Reeve was pretty unique because this was at the height of his success as Superman. And it was made in the gap between parts two and three. And the actor had already experienced the struggle of being typecast, but he was ecstatic to be able to stretch as an actor and show a different side of himself. And let me tell you, if you're only familiar with seeing him in tights and a cape, this is essential viewing because he's fantastic in it. One major change that they made to the play version is the kiss, which wasn't featured there, but proved to be pretty controversial. This was an era where seeing two men kiss on screen was a taboo thing. And when preview audience booed the moment and a Time Magazine article revealed its presence before the release, it's estimated that a large audience portion then avoided the film, hurting it at the box office. Not, not that it did poorly. In fact, it, it pulled in 19 million on a budget of 10 and got a number of very positive reviews. But not everything was favorable because, first of all, it was compared strongly to the 1972 film Sleuth, which also featured Michael Caine, and the plots are extremely close to each other. Secondly, Diane Cannon's performance was lambasted and even earned her a Razzie nomination, saying she played it to camp, although in later years, it was seen for the fun portrayal that it was meant to be. And I really enjoy this. I know it's light on horror, but there's death and intrigue, so why not? And I rate it a four. It's just so well written and acted and staged. Its significance is just a three though, since it's not really horror, so it didn't impact the genre, but it's a laundry list of big names and it did quite well. And it's pretty remembered, just not by horror fans. Should you watch it? Yes, it's a trap worth getting caught in. Why make it anywhere? Why make it? <laughs> because it's there, Sydney. That's mountains, not plays. Plays are not there until some asshole writes them. Oh.
We're all the way into April now, and April 2nd got us another pretty noted film with the release of Silent Rage, which starts off with a man going ballistic and taking an axe to some people. So Walker, Texas Ranger, shows up to investigate. And there, there will be no Chuck Norris is so tough that blah 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 jokes here since I only make highbrow dad puns on this channel. So I'm beneath it? Ab above it? I, I don't know. I'll, I'll just leave it for you guys to do that in the comments. His partner is Flounder, and they duke it out with the mad Libby, and arrest him. His doctor, Ron Silver, appears just in time to see him get gunned down. This guy's body is fantastic. Gee, gee doc, let us know how you really feel. And they decide to try out an experimental procedure on him, and the doc's assistant is the Phantom of the Paradise. But of course they decide to try the old, let's make someone invincible potion on the psychopathic killer. And of course... He, he gets loose and, and starts back up to his murdering ways, leading up to a Norris versus Psycho slasher face-off. And this was handled by Michael Miller. It was an early work for him. He had only made a couple of features and a TV movie before this, but nothing of real note. This same year, he'd also go on to do Class Reunion, which we'll talk about in a few episodes, and would later primarily just handle TV movies. And this script was written specifically for Chuck Norris, with the intentions of making a hybrid karate versus monster movie. Miller also claimed that it wasn't meant to be inspired by slasher movies, even though at times it really feels like one. But he didn't care for those, and instead saw it as sort of a tribute to Frankenstein. One thing of note is that this was one of the first times that Norris did a love scene, and was reportedly very uncomfortable filming one. He also said that he received enough negative feedback from this one that he swore them off in future projects. Although it didn't do well with critics, the reviews weren't that bad, but most called it a by-the-numbers kind of movie with a corny vibe. That aside though, it did pretty well, although nothing to really shout about. With a budget of around 4.5 million bucks, it would gross around 10 and a half, making it successful enough for Miller to want to make a sequel. Unfortunately, Norris himself didn't like the movie and felt like a horror film wasn't the kind of thing that he wanted to go forward with and didn't return any phone calls, meaning that Silent Rage 2 would forever remain quiet. And I'm giving this one a 2. This one's pretty boring. It takes way, way too long to get to the face-off. And when it does, it's well, I mean, it's okay. Its significance is a 2.5 since it did get some attention and is fairly remembered and features enough known faces to achieve notoriety. Should you watch it? I mean, if you're in that whole Chuck Norris cult, then yeah, go for it. You talking to me? <laughs> On that very same day, April 2nd, a very different kind of film was released with Pandemonium, a horror comedy. It starts off back in 1963 with a college football game, and Bambi here is lusting after the football star played by teen heartthrob and polyester star, Tab Hunter. Elvira's nemesis pops up, and then an unseen attacker javelins the entire cheerleading squad. There's a quick cameo by the most underrated reason to watch SNL in the 90s, but then we jump ahead to 1982, and Bambi is back at the school to reopen the cheerleader camp, and Squiggy is on hand, as is Granny Adams, and her mom, Mrs. Peacock. And yeah, Candy here is meant to be a sort of a Carrie parody, complete with an appearance by Mr. Prom. That jerky Gerald is here, probably still picking on Billy, as is Mrs. Fackler and Jimmy Olsen, as everyone arrives to camp. And here's the type of humor that you can expect. Next up on the roster is a Smothers brother, and it, it's weird to just have one, right? Uh, but, but then you have the late, great Paul Rubens appearing, and then to keep that going, this guy here is actually Zombie the Genie. Of course, pretty soon the cheerleaders are getting bumped off one by one in a series of ridiculous manners, and, and this was directed by Alfred Soul, and his story's a, li a little sad. He, he directed a handful of films in the late 70s and early 80s, and this was one of them. But most of them did pretty poorly, although he had a minor hit with Alice Sweet Alice, which benefited from having Brooke Shields in her film debut. It bombed when it first came out, but 
When she hit it big shortly after, it was re-released to cash in on her new fame, and did quite well. This film, though, would go on to be Soul's final film, although he directed some TV here and there, and then shifted solely to production design, where he worked here and there until his suicide in 2022. Oddly enough, before he decided to make Pandemonium, he was slated to handle a straightforward horror film called Ghouls that was cancelled when Terror Train didn't do that well, and then ended up with this script, then called Thursday the 12th, it was scheduled to release back in the fall of 81, but then got pushed back, possibly because that's when Saturday the 14th came out and it wanted to avoid confusion. And the title was switched to Pandemonium. Any of those factors could have hurt the film, but probably more than those were the reviews, which were overwhelmingly negative and pointed out that for a comedy, well, it just wasn't that funny. The budget was fairly small at $5 million, but when a lot of the horror of this era was made for $1 million or 2 this was a bit higher stakes, and it ended up flopping. Meanwhile, here, here's another weird bit. I, Eileen Brennan, who of course plays Candy's mom here, isn't credited in the film itself. Instead, her credit reads, A Friend. And this is another two for me. Uh, sure, I, I have some nostalgia for this, but, but boy does it not hold up. Almost every joke falls flat on its face. Its significance is a three though, because it does have some status, but again, it's mostly cult. But it gave an extra cred for the sheer amount of recognizable faces featured here. Should you watch it? If you're a Groundling fan, then you'll be pretty pleased to see them all featured. But be aware, there's some dud comedy going on. Everyone will see your dirty pillows. Those aren't dirty pillows, Mama. They're brisks. Not those. Those are titties. Those are dirty pillows. April 2nd was a very busy day in the horror world because on that very same date, a very different sort of package was delivered to the box offices. One with a little bit more wicker. And it was Basket Case. It kicks off big with a man being killed by a monstrous creature and then gives us young Dwayne here, strolling down the New York streets with this big old basket in his arms. And this is classic New York with all the porn theaters and sleazy glory. Dwayne checks into a flea bag hotel and there's an assortment of oddball residents there, but it seems like he's one of them since he both talks to and feeds something that's in that basket. Whatever it is, it seems to use telepathy to communicate and when the D goes to visit a doctor, he makes a date with the receptionist. It seems that the boys are tracking down a group of specific docs, and our boy Belial is finally revealed as this misshapen lump of a thing with massive teeth and claws. And it seems to be that the two were Siamese twins, but were separated against their will and now seek revenge on the surgeons who handled the operation. Meanwhile, though, Dwayne finds romance with Sharon, which the B-Man takes some issue with, him being a legless stump and all that leading to fun, low-rent stop-motion animation. And Basket Case was the debut feature film of Frank Heenenlauder, and he was a fan of the Grindhouse films that would screen down on 42nd Street, and decided that it was time to make his own. He managed to scrape together all of his money, eight grand, and a friend later matched that money. And over the course of a few years, scrounged up extra cash, and this started getting it going, they raised a total of $35,000 and shot the film on 16mm. They began filming in 1978 and didn't complete photography until late 81, and Henenlotter frantically edited the footage in his own apartment. The crew was tiny, so tiny that when it came time to make the credits for the film, in an effort to avoid simply having their names repeated over and over, they made up names to fill those slots. It was originally a much more serious film, but as they were shooting, the director decided to add more comedy into the mix, thinking that it would counterbalance the oddness and darkness of the story. That ended up causing their distributor to want to play up the comedy thing, and ordered the gory moments to be cut out. He and Lauder hated that idea and argued against it, but they went ahead with it anyway, and the film debuted in the edited, sanitized version, where it was not a success at all. When they planned to open the film in Dallas, a popular B-movie critic named John Bloom was asked to host the premiere, but he had seen it already at cons, 
and said he wouldn't do it unless it was the original gory version. And they relented. And it was that version that started selling out theaters. It went on to huge success, playing at midnight theaters for years and years, becoming hugely profitable. Although there's no box office numbers available, but it's become known as one of the all-time classic super low-budget horror flicks. Later on, Hen and Lauder would return to the brothers, making two sequels with Basket Case 2 and Basket Case 3, The Progeny. There's also a cameo by Dwayne and the Basket in the director's other film, Basket Case, and the character of Casey, played by Beverly Bonner, would appear in his Frankenhooker, linking all of his works together into one crazy universe. And I really enjoy this movie, and my rating on it is a 4. Sure, the seams show, and it's very rough around the edges, especially with the acting, but it's so charming and so well done that it's all forgiven. Its HCS is a 3.5 since it's one of the more well-known cult flicks, but it's never hit the mainstream in the way that it could have, or that something like, like that The Evil Dead did. Should you watch it? Yes, you should, or else they'll send Belial after you. This isn't a hotel, it's a house! This block ends on that same day, April 2nd, with a much bigger release. And it's a doozy since we're talking about cat people. It starts off in a surreal way with a woman being sacrificed and a black panther that I think is, I think is telling her a secret or something. And then another woman meeting a cat in a cave. You know, the, the usual opening for a film. Then in present day, we meet daughter of Klaus and she's approached by some druid. And what is that haircut? What, what is that outfit? He's Irina's brother and they meet mother-sister, but their relationship is uh, strange. Lynn Lowry is here too as a prostitute attacked by a leopard, so they call in Kevin McAllister's dad, Lana Lang, and Stan Sitwell to investigate as they work for the zoo and they trank the big kitty. Meanwhile, Irina goes to check out uh, the city and passes by this um, interesting piece of art and encounters that leopard. Like, like, damn, they just caught the thing that morning they, uh, and they've got a home for it at the zoo already. That, that's pretty damn quick. Dan Fielding shows up and Irina and Oliver meet up and hit it off and he gets her a job there. The leopard kills and then vanishes and suddenly Paul, who had gone missing, reappears. Then Coconut Sid pops in, so this is, this is a, a bit of a do the right thing prequel. Turns out that Paul has a secret basement full of dead bodies and a big cat cage, so he's blamed for the leopard being loose. But then things take a turn when it's revealed that Paul actually is the panther and that he's a werecat, as is Irina, and he's trying to become her mate. And, and this was actually sort of a remake, although it's been drastically altered in terms of the themes and such. Like, the core basis of the story is similar, but this version is just a whole hell of a lot hornier. Paul Schrader was brought on to direct, fresh off the success of American Gigolo, and he had also previously directed the gritty Hardcore with George C. Scott, but this would be his first entry into the horror world, a genre that he wouldn't really return to until his attempt at the Exorcist prequel, although he did have the TV movie Witch Hunt in there as well. It ended up being a wild shoot for him as he claimed to be really high for a large portion of it. One day, not even being able to leave his trailer, leaving everyone waiting around and losing an entire day of shooting. There's also an unsubstantiated story that he was having an affair with Natasha Kinski during the filming and was quite taken with her, only to get ghosted at the end of it, and later explained that she has sex with all of her directors. Kinski denies that story, though. The reviews were pretty solid, although not overwhelmingly so, and it did some decent business, earning $21 million on a budget of 12, making it a nice hit, but not, not, a, not a huge smash or anything. And most of the attention went to the soundtrack by the great Giorgio Moroder, featuring David Bowie on vocals for the theme song, who also makes a cameo in the movie. And the score would go on to be nominated for a couple of Golden Globe Awards. And this one gets a three and a half from me. I like it. I like the mood. I, I wish it got to the point a bit quicker, though. And, and we didn't have to wait so damn long for them to give us the transformation stuff that we were looking for. 
its HCS is the same since it was a higher profile project, uh, um, a remake, had big names attached in front of and behind the camera, and some memorable effects. Should you watch it? Yeah, uh, even if you're a dog person. Leopards eat pizza. Well, the scavengers. He probably raided a garbage can before he went to the massage parlor. It doesn't look like he went there out of hunger. Maybe he was horny. So there you have it, the first portion of 1982, a really solid block of movies to start this year off. There was some really good stuff in here. I'd have to say my favorite, though, um, it's pretty tough competition, but my favorite, personal favorite, is Bats the Case. I just think it's a lot of fun. I love that low-budget charm. Belial is just a really bizarre little creation. Um, it was pretty close with Death Trap. Death Trap is a great flick. Um, but if I had to pick between the two, I'm watching Basket Case because it's silly fun. Let me know your favorite down below in the comments. I want to hear that. Tell me which of your favorite of these block. Um, tell me which ones you've seen, which ones you'd like to see, or ones you've never heard of but are now interested in checking out. Tell me that down below. Hit the like button. Subscribe to the channel if you like what you see. And of course, hit the bell if you want notified when new episodes come out. Also, check out my Patreon page at patreon.com slash movie timelines where you can help support this channel and keep it going. But yeah, I hope you enjoyed the first part of 82. We've got a lot to cover in this year. And so stay tuned. Stay tuned and check it out right here on The 80s Project. <laughs>